Howdy folks. So uh, this is Tesla, my uh, 24 terabyte ZFS file server, which I uh, featured in a previous video. And uh, the way that this, uh, the way that the drives are all configured in here, there's, there's 10 disks total. There's two SSDs and eight disks, seven of which are in a RAID Z1, a RAID 1's just a spare. Now the motherboard has just six SATA ports and the other four are derived from a PCI Express X1 uh, expansion card, which is really not a very high-end card at all. In fact, it's a very low-end consumer card. And the way that that works uh, is there's actually a, a PCI Express to PCI adapter chip on that, uh, on that actual controller. So it's a PCI controller that's being run over PCI Express. So the, the bandwidth of that controller is really limited, especially when you have four disks on it. And that's uh, been a problem that I've known about for quite a while, and I've never really bothered to address it. Um, the, the time you really notice it is when you're doing a ZFS scrub. Uh, for example, I've got 18 terabytes of data on this, and the scrub takes about 27 hours. Um, simply because it can only scrub at about 180 megabytes a second and I believe that is because of the bandwidth limit on that card limiting those four drives which brings the whole system performance down. So I thought I would try and address this. Now I could go out on eBay or something and buy a proper you know LSI or Adaptech SATA SAS card but uh, I was rummaging through my old stuff and found that I actually own this. And uh, this is uh, an LSI slash Intel SAS3041E um, host bus adapter. Now this is uh, actually SATA and SAS. And it's kind of unconventional in the fact that it actually has uh, the, SATA, the SATA connectors directly on the device rather than um, requiring a breakout cable, which is kind of nice because this is pretty much a drop-in replacement for me. It's four disks uh, and it's PCI Express X4. So uh, it's actually it does actually have the proper bandwidth for four disks. Now it is only SATA 2. It's quite an old card. In fact, it's actually from uh, 2005 to 2007. That's what the copyright says. So it's definitely quite old, but I mean the disks that I have probably won't saturate uh, that anyway, so I'm not worried about putting this in. It'll definitely perform better than what I've got now. Now there's two things that are really stopping me from putting this in. Uh, the first one is a software bug, uh, pretty much to do with the Linux kernel. Um, this will not spin down disks. And what I mean by that is when you turn off uh, the machine, of course, Linux will spin down all the hard disks before it sends the ACPI power off command. Um, and of course this is to park all the heads. And this works on every machine that I have, on every controller that I have except for this one. This will not power off disks, it just cuts the power and the disks go into emergency, emergency retract, which is something that I really try to avoid. And uh, I've got the card out on this uh, just test bench platform with some old 80 gig drives. And the reason for this is just so that I can try and, uh, I, I just wanted to see if there was anything I could do with the shutdown scripts to get this to power off disks. And what I was able to do was uh, in the like uh, etc rc0 um, init scripts, I was able to run like hdparm and you know run dash y and actually spin down the disks but the problem is the kernel, when it actually runs halt, it'll do a flush for the disk cache and it forces that, it doesn't matter whether it's already been flushed. So it will always spin the disks back up and then power off and there's nothing I can do aside from compiling my own kernel that's gonna fix that and I really don't wanna do that. So given the, like, the number of times the, device, the, the server actually powers off completely uh, is maybe a couple times a year at max, uh, I'm 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 sort of okay with putting this in service. Um, I, I I really dislike just cutting power to disks, but I I think the the benefits of this will probably outweigh that, uh, just given the fact that it doesn't turn off very often. 
The second problem, uh, which is more of a physical problem, is the fact that this is PCI Express X4, and the motherboard that is in Tesla right now doesn't have any spare slots. Now, it has uh, two, uh, two PCI Express X1 slots, and it has two uh, X16 slots. Now, the two X16 slots, one of them's got an X8 InfiniBand card, the other one has an X4 uh, dual gigabit Ethernet card, and the current HBA is in one of the X1 slots, and the other one's currently free. So, of course, if I take out the HBA, it frees up an X1 slot, but that doesn't help me at all. So, what I really have to do is get that dual port gigabit card into an X1 slot, which is fully doable. Um, people have done it before. The chip that's on it is electrically compatible with X1. So I have to be able to just somehow get an X4 card into an X1 slot. So I tried my hand this morning at trying to cut um, the actual slots on this motherboard because I don't really care about this motherboard. Uh, ended up pooching both of these slots, so um, they're fucked now. Um, I tried. So I tried. I looked at some tips online. I've tried with um, Exacto knives, side cutters. I've tried with my Dremel, um, both cutting it in both orientations. And uh, I mean, yes, I could probably do it, but none of it, none of it is really clean, and I don't really like it, and I don't like risking that. So. Uh, I think the better option is to cut the card, um, and that's really not that hard to do, because I can. Because I think it's a lot safer to be to be honest, just to do that. Um, because PCI Express X1 is just um, one pin over from that notched pin there, so I could cut all the pins off, or I could come in uh, in this direction and just cut maybe three of the pins out, and uh, just to get it over. That little uh, that little gap at the end of the socket, so that it sits down and these will just dangle over the edge, which is fine with me. So, the thing is, there's a lot less that can go wrong because if you only cut inside the area that doesn't have any solder mask, there's no traces on the inside of the board there. So you just have to cut right on the lower side of that line, and uh, you really have no risk of anything going wrong. And this is PCB material, so it's relatively soft and easy to cut with a with a wheel on a Dremel. And also the fact is this you can just take out, put it on a table, and you have all the room in the world to work. Whereas with something like this, you've got to either take the whole board out, which is an immense thing, which I, I really don't have the time to do, or you've got to somehow get it in here and you're not going to get the right angle because of the heat sinks and all the other stuff that's in there. So uh, I think I'll definitely be cutting the card instead. So uh, I think that is the plan for today. I got to, uh, I'm just going to install some updates on that machine because it's been up for about 215 days. I think it's uh, time I installed some updates. And then uh, I'll reboot, make sure that not, the updates didn't break anything. And then once once I've confirmed that, I will uh, get to cutting the, uh, the network card. Uh, worst case scenario, and the network card doesn't work, I can just fall back to the internal Intel single port LAN until I can order a new card because they still make like they don't make them anymore but uh, they're very easily to get on eBay and they're only about 50 bucks so worst case scenario I pooch the card I can get another one unlike the motherboard which they don't make anymore and that's not as easy to find so yeah so let me just do that and uh, I'll get to cutting the card so I just uh, finished modifying the network card and as you can see I've taken out the pins that prevent it from getting into an X1 slot and I've uh, plugged it into just a, a random motherboard and it fits. So uh, I'm going to put this back in the machine now that I've dusted it out. It's all clean now. And, uh, well, I guess, uh, hope it still works. I guess there's really only one way to find out. And uh, that's to try it out. Test in production. That's uh, not something I like to do, but something I often find myself doing. So I just installed the new HBA moved the uh, new modded card into an X1 slot. Um, it The light came on when I connected a cable, so it's got the awake on LAN seems to be working, so the card still sort of live, but again, moment of truth, I'm gonna do it live on camera. Uh, this is not a scene you see every day, this thing booting up. You'll hear the discs, because this case is really cheap, it doesn't have any noise damping, damping and it's something I wanna replace at some point. Next time I need to get a disc, of course, the, the case is full, so I'll have to do that. And uh, yeah, you can hear all the discs vibrate uh, as they all spin up in unison. So uh, 
Here goes. You can see the power consumption peaks as all the disks spin up. Now the uh, that logic, uh, that LSI controller that I added, uh, spins them up a little bit differently than the uh, the built-in controller. So that was a little bit different sounding than what I'm used to. That beep probably was the uh, no keyboard found beep, so I'm not too worried. Yeah, the OS is definitely booting. Now the big worry, of course, is does ZFS find all of the drives now that they've changed location? Now I used the serial number for the disks when I made the pool, so theoretically it should find all the disks, but I'm not quite sure. Let me, uh, let me try and SSH in and see if it's booted up. I can't quite tell at this point. So I, uh, I SSH'd into the machine, and uh, I could do that, which was, first of all, great, because that means the network card was fine. But uh, then I checked the pool status for the ZFS pool that's on here, and the pool wasn't found. And of course, you know, my heart's like skipping a beat at this point. I'm really quite terrified. And I'm thinking, well, what's wrong? So I, I do LS bulk to see all the disks, and it shows all my four terabyte disks that are on the normal, you know, motherboard controller, and they're all fine. And then it lists four disks that are on the um, the LSI controller as two terabyte disks. And immediately I remembered this controller cannot recognize disks above two terabytes. And of course, these are all four terabyte disks. So uh, I sort of immediately went, you know, abort, abort, and uh, shut the machine down. I uh, put the old card back in and uh, booted it up and uh, it appears to be fine now. So unfortunately, uh, my little experiment failed. Um, I, I, I can't use this card. So I'm gonna have to go out and buy uh, a proper HBA uh, that's modern and uh, supports proper uh, modern disks, uh, unfortunately. So I'm gonna be probably out at least 150 to 200 bucks probably for that even used anything that would be you know workable um, is, is going to be a problem I mean I don't have to go with a big hardware raid controller because of course I'm, I'm just literally anything that does JBOD is good enough but finding one that does JBOD and actually has a proper interface on it is difficult so uh, I guess I'll just keep looking but uh, at least uh, nothing, nothing really harmful happened. At least uh, the good thing about this is uh, I tested the network card and that works fine. So this was something that I was holding off doing to my main app server, Watt, uh, because that machine uh, needs this done if I want to put InfiniBand in it. So now that I know that it works, uh, there's really nothing that's going to stop me from putting InfiniBand in that machine other than you know about 200 bucks for the hardware and cable. So uh, maybe, uh, maybe I'll do that, but uh, I want to deal with this thing first. So anyway, hopefully that little foray was, uh, was interesting. Thanks for watching.